Thank you for tuning in today. How to Become an Obstacle Buster podcast is helping sales professionals and entrepreneurs to overcome their obstacles by providing strategies, tips, and insights in achieving success. I'm Warren Wandling, and on this show, I'll take you behind the scenes to get to know a variety of leaders and keys to their success. If you're ready for a breakthrough, download my free book, Be a Lead Magnet, How to Create Leads and Attract Clients, a personal coaching guide. Go to warrenwandling.com. Now, on to the show. Welcome back to another episode of How to Become an Obstacle Buster. I'm your host, Warren Wandling. If this is your first time listening or you've been part of our community for a while, thank you for tuning in today. We all have dreams and we have obstacles in our lives. My hope for you is that you overcome your obstacles while you're pursuing your dreams. I have a great guest with me today, Joel Goldberg, a native of suburban Philadelphia and Chicago. Joel Goldberg has been a member of the KC Royals television broadcast since 2008, serving as the host of every pregame and postgame show on Fox Sports Kansas City. The University of Wisconsin graduate won a 2001 Mid-America Emmy for sports reporting and has covered multiple championship teams in Major League Baseball and the National Football League. Joe built a nearly 25-year career developing and maintaining strong relationships with professional athletes, coaches, and team management, and now he shares those stories and strategies with companies and associations. Welcome to the show, Joel. Warren, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to our conversation today on how to become an Obstacle Buster podcast. We provide strategies, tips, and resources for sales professionals and entrepreneurs to overcome their obstacles to achieve success. So really to start that conversation today, Joel, as part of the Royals broadcast team for Fox Sports Kansas City since 2008, keynote presenter and MC, share an overview of your career. Well, I, I guess, and it might sound a little bit cliche, but I'm living my dream and it's not an exaggeration, but I also know that there are a lot of people that don't get a chance to live their dream. We're all trying to put food on the table, so to speak, support our families and, and make a living. And I grew up loving sports. I also grew up at a certain point realizing that the odds of me hitting the game-winning home run in a, in a World Series or having a big moment in any professional sport was probably going to be non-existent because I was an average athlete, loved it. But as a kid, I found myself sitting in front of the TV with the volume down, announcing games, and it was my dream to be on TV and be a broadcaster. And and so I, I broke in in 1994, a few months out of college, doing local news in a small town, making absolutely no money and not caring that I was making no money because it was the start of uh, of my dream. And, and I was lucky enough to, to work my way in. And now 24 years later, I'm, I'm still doing that, but traveling for baseball and it's a pretty much a 24-7 job for six months of the year and on the side, maybe not on the side, at the same time doing a lot of public speaking. Yeah, that's excellent, Joel. I love, though, that you share the story of that you're living your dream because I want to encourage our listeners that wherever they are in their journey, breaking through that obstacle, to stay persistent and working towards that dream. I agree, and I, I do think that there's a really important message for Anyone out there, no matter what you do. I mean, I, I like to say so often in my speaking business that it's not about baseball. It's not about sports. And yes, no doubt about it. I live in that world. But I think it applies really to everyone. We all deal with failure in life, whether that be on the personal side, the business side. I don't think anybody ever goes through life having never heard no or experiencing some stumbling blocks. And I, I think that there are so many good examples in sports and, and even in broadcasting because the odds of making it are so minimal that if you give up, you're never going to get there. And I see it all the time in baseball in, in terms of the team that I cover, the Kansas City Royals. They're 
arguably their best player is a guy by the name of Whit Merrifield that was toiling in the minor leagues forever and was contemplating quitting. And he just kept on going and going and going. And, and, and now he's the leader of this team and he's the veteran on this team. And he's, he, he didn't take no for an answer. And it wasn't just, Oh, I, I made it. At least I got a little bit of time in the big leagues. No, he, he didn't just make it. He, he, he made it and is now extremely accomplished and I see that story every single day, whether it be in sports or not. And even for myself, I, I, Warren, I, I was told no over and over and over again for months out of college and suddenly realized that if I was going to live this dream, I was going to have to take charge and make it happen myself and not rely on others to do it. And I just started knocking door to door, driving around the country and, and getting a foot indoors. And once I opened that door, it gave me that path. What is the greatest obstacle that professional athletes encounter? Well, there's so much, and I think I think there's some similarities in all of the sports, but I think that baseball, what makes baseball different is that it's every day. I mean, it's got to be the only field, sports or not, where you're considered one of the best when you're successful 30% of the time. From a hitting standpoint, if you can be successful three out mm-hmm. of ten times, you're one of the better ones in the league. And I bring that up because not because the standards are set low. It's what a reminder that it's really hard to hit a professional baseball pitcher that's throwing 95 miles an hour. And once you time that up, suddenly something's coming in and curving at 78 miles an hour. And so there, there's so much to it, but I bring it up because baseball is a game of failure. And I think what makes the best baseball players to go with the skill because guess what you can have all the skill in the world the greatest players of all time uh, i wasn't around for babe ruth but the barry bonzes and the albert pools and the miguel cabrera's guys that i all covered they had this ability mentally uh, looking in, in basketball michael jordan kobe bryant uh, you look at tiger woods that's relevant right now those are guys that had elite level skill but what made them better than all the rest was that mental toughness, that that ability to handle failure. And in baseball, if you know that on average you're going to be failing seven or eight out of every ten times, the ones that do best are the ones that handle it. The ones that do best push it aside, that moment's over, and you just move on to the next one. And I think that's one of the great lessons of baseball, which very much to me is like life, that you have a bad day, a bad moment, you're not waiting a week like you do in football to come back. It's tomorrow again. I mean, you know, I, uh, the Kansas City Royals, as we're recording this right now, are in the middle of 19 straight games in 19 days in five cities. There's no time to feel sorry for yourself. So I think there's a great lesson there with the athletes. And then the other thing that I would say, too, is the attention to detail. It's not just enough to be good. You've got to do your homework. You've got to you know, take care of your body and work out and eat. Uh, Look, some of us are made for that. Some of us aren't Uh, probably more on the aren't side of things there. But the, the greater message is there's so much involved in process. There's so much involved in preparation. And when you're prepared, I think if you're good enough and you're working hard enough and you're prepared, I really think you can do just about anything. Yeah, I love that. I love that illustration that you shared, Joel, in reference to baseball, to life, because there's not enough time to be able to to spend time on those failures, but having the right mindset and that bounce ability to go to the next and to continue disciplining yourself in the in the actions on a daily basis to keep moving forward. You you have to move forward. I, I can't tell you how often. I have friends or people within my network that'll say during a losing streak. And, you know, I mean, this is, I've been in television now almost 25 years, but it's, it's 12 years of traveling with the Royals. They, they, they they won a championship. They also had a lot of really bad years and and they're um, struggling early again this year. And people say, boy, how do you do it? And I got to go back and do a show again tomorrow. I've got to get back again the next day and the next day. I, I don't have time to sit there and dwell on it. First off, it's a little bit easier for me if you can get out of the mindset of being like your average fan, which by the way, being a fan 
is supposed to involve that emotion. Being a fan sometimes involves some of that irrational thought. It's all the things that get you away from the reality of life. And so if you if you want to get really upset over a game or really high or really low, that's part of being a fan. But when you're in the middle of it, certainly as a player, but you know, I, I consider myself very involved, not necessarily with the success of the team, but I mean I am part of everyone that is involved with this. And if I'm gonna sit there and lose sleep or struggle with losses, I, I'm I'm not gonna be very energetic and effective today and tomorrow. And there is no chance to hit that pause button. I think some people, you know, and uh, in work and hit that pause button maybe over the weekend if they're lucky enough to have weekends off. But we don't really have that right now. And so I, I think, you know, I would say that when you do have that moment, when you do have that weekend, hit that pause button and do what you can to re-energize because you need that energy. I and mean, energy is so important. And even for me in the middle of this 19-game stretch, we had a day game recently on a Thursday and a night game on Friday with no travel. And for me just to get home at five o'clock that night instead of midnight and to be able to have 22 almost hours till I went back to work, sit on the couch, relax, hang out with my family. It was almost like having two or three days off. And I was very aware of that. So I think it's just being very self-conscious of, of what you can do to handle the failures and, and keep your energy up. So what was a key strategy that contributed to your success? in developing your broadcasting career? Well, I think it's, to me, it's, it's two or three things. I mean, the first I, I briefly mentioned it was, was not taking no for an answer. And, and I will say too, I mean, for, for any of your listeners that are saying, well, I'm not really the cold calling type. I am absolutely not the cold calling type. It is, it's uncomfortable to me. I, I'm so much better when I'm introduced to someone or I know someone. But if you want it badly enough, you'll do it. And, you know, I got to a point where I was getting rejected by everyone. And this is, keep in mind, 1994, Internet's just sort of starting, email is around. We don't have all these websites. Certainly don't have social media. So I just went about things the old-fashioned way. And I said, okay, how? I, I remember the turning point. I'd gotten a rejection letter in the mail from a TV station in Missoula, Montana, I and here I am sitting in my parents' house, recent college graduate. I'm in Chicago, and I've never been to Montana. And thinking, I can't even get a job in, you know, in this small area. How am I ever going to get in? And I started picking up the phone, looking up TV stations and numbers. And I would call. And, and again, not being able to look up who was running the show, I'd call and say to the receptionist, you know, who's your news director? And I'd get the name, and I'd hang up. And 10 minutes later, I'd call back and ask for that person. And, and then I would say, hey, I, I'm a recent graduate, and I just happened to be driving through Terre Haute next week, or I just happened to be driving through Quincy, Illinois, or Rochester, New York, or Rochester, Minnesota, uh, Wausau, Wisconsin. Could I stop in, hand off the tape to you, and, and, and introduce myself? And most of the time, they'd say yes, and that's when I started to plan the trip to their city. I was never really going to be going. But suddenly... I put myself ahead of everyone else. I wasn't really better than anyone else. I mean, look, if we all remember when we were 21, 22 years old, we might have thought we had it all figured out, but, you know, we don't know a whole lot unless you're some kind of prodigy. And so I was no better than anyone else, but I put myself to the front of the line. And that's what opened the door. And then it's up to you once you're there. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I figured out, and this took me a lot longer, uh, but really it's the same lesson, was that people are people. And once I learned that I was not in the baseball business. I was in the people business. It made me so much better because when you walk up to a superstar or think in the business world to, to that big name CEO or that hotshot salesman or whatever, whoever it is, and if you start treating them and putting them on a pedestal like they're the greatest of all time, yeah, they like to be spoiled and everybody likes to be given things and taken care of. But it's awkward when people don't treat you like a normal person. And when I figured out how to start talking to the Albert Pujolses of the world that I might not have even had anything in common with, but started focusing more on the person than the needs, what I wanted, everything became better. And then it all became about relationship building. So to me, those have been the, probably the two biggest developments in my career. 
As a keynote speaker, one of the topics that you present is entitled Making a Splash with Championship Culture. You share a winning game plan that can help organizations on the field or in the office place. Can you share with our listeners just one tip developing a championship culture? Yeah, and there are lots. So I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll give you one, and it is really a word that I use in multiple speeches. It's the word of trust, because I believe that when you can build trust, that you can do anything. When you when you trust those around you and they trust you, it's amazing how you can work together. Joe Madden, the world championship manager of the Chicago Cubs, who I got to know when he was the manager of the um, Tampa Bay Rays. But you know, think of you think about Joe Madden, he's he's the first manager to take the Cubs to a to a world championship in over a hundred years. So uh, he, Joe's kind of a, a renaissance type of man. And I asked him last year, I said, uh, you know, what does trust mean to you? And because he's a renaissance man, he immediately turned to me and he said, well, you know, I have a print that I just designed with an artist about trust and I'm selling it for charity. And of course he does because he's a renaissance man, but there was a diagram on it and it says, build relationships, trust, exchange ideas, constructive criticism flows. So what he was saying by that, and he explained it to me, was that when you build a relationship, you have to build the trust. Once you build the trust with the people around you, you can start to exchange ideas. Once those ideas are exchanged, then you can have constructive criticism that flows back and forth without feeling like you're jumping on someone, without, as he said, feeling like you're ameliorate, being ameliorated by the boss. And so that's true in anything in life. If I walk into a room and give a keynote speech, and I'll do this sometimes, and I point and I look at someone and I say, hey, what department are you in? I'm, I'm in the shipping department. Okay, you know, here's one way I think you can do your job better. I don't have any trust with that person. I don't have any relationship with that person. But if I could work on that first, now those ideas can go back and forth. We can help each other. And when you get everybody on the same page, that's where you have that championship culture. doesn't guarantee you're going to win every single time, but culture is something that is not built overnight. It takes a long time to build, but it's also something that takes daily effort. Every single day, there has to be a focus on it. The other quick thing I want to mention in terms of trust is it's not just trusting each other. It's trusting a process. And we all need some kind of process. And it's so easy because we're all in a results-driven whatever profession we're in. It's all about results. It's all about wins and losses. And sometimes you have to push that aside a little bit and trust that that process is going to work instead of completely throwing darts and trying to figure, well, this didn't work. Let's try this. Let's try this. Let's try this. And I'm not saying you can't change, but I think that when you trust who you are, what your process is, who your organization is, who you are as a person, and build that trust within – that's one of the really key ingredients to building the championship culture. It's what I saw with the Kansas City Royals. And I will say that, you know, they were an awful team for a lot of years. They built a culture, really took about eight years. And they're back to losing again because they lost a lot of players. But their culture is still there. And in part, because of what they built and that process was passed on to the younger guys. And as those younger guys emerge, they're not suddenly going to be searching for how to do things because that process and trusting that process is already in place. Yeah, how you illustrated trust drill, I think it's really clear in reference to the, those steps. And I love watching the Royals because the way that you've just illustrated, right, that culture's there and you can still feel the energy and that drive. And it senses that there really is the trust within the team that they're going to keep driving towards that winning game. And that's hard because, again, as I mentioned – you know, fans aren't signing up for process. Fans are signing up for wins. <laughs> you go to the ballpark because you want to see a win. You tune in because you want to see a win. But I do think it's deeper than that. I mean, I, I think that in general, especially when you see that it's worked before, there becomes more of a belief. So in the past, when, say, Royals fans, or think of any team that has struggled or any organization that's been down for a long time and up, we got a new CEO again. You know, oh, we've got a new 
manager or general manager that's promising us the world again. It's hard to believe in that when you've never seen it. So for years in Kansas City, by whoever was running the show, fans were told this is going to be a time. We're going to do it. We're going to win. And blah, blah, blah. And then it never worked. So this time, they're struggling again as they rebuild. And they don't even really want to call it a rebuild. But there's a lot more. I just sense it. I, I sense more of a patience and an understanding. That doesn't mean there isn't plenty of criticism. But I just sense more of a belief that it's going to work because fans, too, have been a part of that process. And, you know, the general manager, Dave Moore, when I first met him, and he's the architect of all of this, I remember asking him, what are you trying to do? And he got there before me. So he was a year and a half in, and he said, I want to build a championship culture. And I'm not just talking about the 25 players in the locker room. I'm talking about the whole organization, from the ticket takers and the beer vendors to all the fans. And, you know, I show this image in my championship culture speech, but it's one of the images of their championship parade and 800,000 people in one place. And to me, that that photo symbolizes culture, a championship culture. 800,000 people all on the same page in one place celebrating victory. That's that's when you know that, that you have built something. Yeah, that's excellent. I think some uh, cultures think they assume they have trust because they have a position. But I love the strategy of building the, that relationship, exchanging ideas, and that's when you finally really start building trust within the organization. And that's, you know, that's another one, too, that, that you know, I mean, you were asking about things that, that I had learned and, and some of the strategies, but, but once I realized that, you know, in treating some of these guys like an Albert Pujols, like normal people, and when you actually start maybe asking for some advice every now and then, I was talking to a player on the Royals yesterday, a role player, and You know, we were just kind of talking about how so many people, this isn't just sports either, are too afraid to ask for help or they have too much pride or they're afraid that they're going to be looked down upon. It's somehow some kind of weakness. And I've never understood that. I've always felt like if if you could ask somebody their opinion or their help or get their advice, doesn't mean you have to take it, by the way, either. One, it might make you better. You might learn. As this player yesterday a veteran guy named Lucas Duda told me, he said, I'm still trying to learn every day. And I'm, I've been in this game a lot longer than most of the people in, in, in our locker room. So constantly keeping your eyes open and learning and, 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 and observing and, and picking out some of these little things that could be, be bigger. But I also think that when you ask someone for their advice, as long as it's in an authentic way, if you ask for someone advice, for their advice, I don't think it shows weakness. I, I think it shows that you're interested in, in their opinion. I think it shows that you're you're valuing them. So how do you overcome obstacles on a day-to-day basis? Well, I, for me, there one, I think it's an expectation that there will be obstacles every day. But as we're recording this right now, mm-hmm. we have our pregame show. So I host the pregame and the postgame show on TV every day. And I can promise you that nothing is going to go exactly as planned. But that's life. And if you expect and understand that things aren't always going to go the way you thought and you're willing to be flexible, you know, remember before I was talking about sticking to a process, you can still stick to your process, but you do have to be able to bend and adapt to situations because it's one thing to have a process. There's another thing for that plan to exactly match that process. Nothing is ever going to go as planned in life. I mean, take the example as simple as, uh, is driving to work or driving to somewhere where you need to be and you know it takes 20 minutes to get there and suddenly there's an accident on, on the highway and, and it's 35 minutes and you know you suddenly start you know freaking out or whatever it is and you really shouldn't be freaking out as, as people that talk about mindset and you know controlling your mind and controlling the things that you can control and, and all that um, we're, we're so often surprised by things that shouldn't surprise us. So for me, and I think that this is what helps with, I was talking about being prepared when, when you've been doing something as long as me. So let's say on average, I host 300 shows a summer, which by the way, is more FaceTime than anyone should ever have to see me. But, um, you know, I'm, if they want to keep putting me on, that's great. But I I get, you know, I get this, this, this face gets more airtime than, than, uh, that it probably should. But, with that said, there's so much repetition 
And in baseball terms, we talk about, you know, the more bats you get batting practice and muscle memory and all that. I think that's true of what, what anybody does. And so sometimes I'll have people say to me, do you ever get nervous? It's live TV. And I said, like, almost never. Now, it wasn't always that way. But if you think about doing 300 shows a summer for 11 plus years, you know, that's well over 3,000 shows. I'm not saying that I won't see something today that I haven't seen before. But whatever I see today that was unexpected won't fluster me because I've done it over and over again. So I think it's just a, it's it's a repetition, but it's also an expectation and an understanding that things aren't always going to go your way. So roll with it, and that's what I love about live TV. I, I, it's a live TV to me is is the greatest the 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 greatest tool to allow you to handle anything, and. Not that anyone can go on live TV and just get that practice. But for me, I, I just feel like, you know, hey, let's roll with it and make the best of it. So I think to me, that's the biggest thing is just, you know, to use the, the baseball term, well, life's going to throw you curveballs and you got to adjust to them. So I believe that success leaves clues. And one of those clues are the books and authors that you associate with. Are there any top books that you can recommend that have influenced you in your career? Oh my gosh. Um, there's so many and I could also, before I, I give you, well, I can't give you a list of all of them because otherwise people will be going on and on and on. But I want to say that my, my kind of go-to book when I just need a pick me up is uh, it's, it's a baseball book. Although believe it or not, I don't read a ton of baseball books. But it's a baseball book by Joe Posnanski, who's a good friend of mine, and I think one of the best sports writers in, in the world. Um, he wrote a book called The Soul of Baseball, and it, he followed around the legendary Buck O'Neill, who was a uh, longtime Negro Leagues player, manager, beloved figure in, in Kansas City. He was a scout in the major leagues, uh, passed away in 2006. And there's so many deep lessons. He, he was kind of the eternal optimist of, of turning things upside down. I, I remember an example in that book where he said something, uh, uh, Joe was with him at a game in Houston and, you know, and, and the foul ball is coming and, and some, you know, older guy reaches out and, and catches the foul ball right in front of a little kid. And Joe was all upset saying, you know, I mean, how can he do that to that poor kid? And, and Buck O'Neill's response was, well, how do you don't know that, how do you know that he doesn't have a grandson at home that he's getting that ball for? Uh, so, you know, almost challenging yourself to always see someone else's shoes, to walk in, in someone else's shoes. Uh, you know, Stephen Covey talks about that a lot um, in, in, in his book. And, and that's another one is is walking in someone else's shoes and understanding that, which I think is so critical in in life, because you don't always know what's going on in in someone else's head. So I think that that's a big one, and I, I do feel like since I started my speaking business, I'm reading about seven books at once because I feel like somebody is somebody is suggesting something to me almost every day. The one that that I've been looking at a little bit. Um, from a recommendation from multiple people is a book called Mindset by Carol Dweck. And and that's been a really interesting one too. Um, but we could go on and on and do a whole nother podcast. Um, no, the one other I think that I would, um, that I would say was um, this came from Joe Madden. I was telling you about him being a Renaissance man, um, but it was um, Malcolm Gladwell's book. Oh yeah. And, and that was, before it really took, remember, like, I mean, once it took off, everybody knew about it. But I remember uh, Joe Madden telling me about that or asking him about that because I think somebody had written an article. And that really opened my eyes to that, too, which was really fascinating. So what does the future hold for you, Joel? Are, are you working on any um, special projects? Yeah, actually, I am. And it's a lot. I'm, I'm probably doing too much, but I love it. So on top of all the baseball stuff and the speaking, and then I've got my podcast, but we are working on what's going to essentially be, and it's going to come out probably in May, 
I want to do, so I do a weekly podcast rounding the bases and I want to add a video supplement. And I don't mean in a way, I know a lot of people are going to video right now and, and, you know, posting their sit down interview on video. And, and that's great. Um, I don't, like I said before, I, I get enough TV time. I don't know if anybody wants to see me interviewing somebody else for 45 minutes on YouTube. Maybe they would. But what I want to be able to do when the situation presents itself is if you think in terms of a podcast, obviously it's audio, but I think there's some times where show and tell, for lack of a better expression, could really play in and, and, and be worthwhile. And so some of these podcasts that I do interviewing entrepreneurs and CEOs and leaders, if, if there's some really good visuals to it that could be shared or some kind of tour of a facility or whatever it is, what, what we're going to start doing is adding a, you know, two, three, four, maybe five minute video supplement to, to coexist with that podcast. So, okay, you've heard the interview, but here's some behind the scenes type of stuff. Um, and so rounding the basis is the podcast. We're going to call that video supplement the game of life. So that's one. And then there's, I think I'm probably at a point now where, where we're starting to kind of look at, at some book ideas and, and writing uh, a book at some point or, or maybe multiple books. And that's really exciting, but also extremely daunting to me because I've never done it before. But, you know, when I started this, everybody said, you need to write a book if you're doing a speaking business. And I kind of, I didn't blow it off. I just wasn't ready. And so I went the podcast route, which was much more my, you know, my speed. Uh, so that's coming and, and we'll see what, what comes of it. Well, excellent. I love your podcast, by the way, Joel. I love listening to the guests that you bring on. I mean, just great insight that you're able to draw out. Well, I, you know, and, and I think this, and you're doing this too, Warren, but, you know, life is all about storytelling, I believe, and, and we're seeing such a focus on that right now. And that's something I've done for 24 years in broadcasting. And like I said before, I'm not, I'm not a baseball guy. I love baseball, but I'm a storyteller and I'm a people person. And when you can share those stories, whether they be sports stories, business stories, life stories with others, and if it helps them, inspires people or they learn from it, then I, I think... Hopefully you're giving back and, you know, and you're helping make other people better. But one of my guests, uh, my first season, I'm on season two right now, was um, a guy by the name of Pat Williams, who was a longtime general manager, executive in, in the NBA with the Philadelphia 76ers and then the Orlando Magic. He drafted, you don't have to be a huge basketball fan to know these names. He drafted Charles Barkley and Shaquille O'Neal. So, I mean, this was a guy that's been around the ultimate. He's a speaker all over the world. And he said to me, he said, the world is not made of atoms, Joel. The world is made of stories. And that really resonated with me because I think that everybody has a story to tell. And I think that's what we and you included um, have that chance to do on these podcasts. Yeah, that's excellent. So with, uh, if our listeners wanted to connect with you, what's the best way for them to be able to reach out? Well, I'm, I'm all on social media, so that certainly is one way. I think the easiest way to get a hold of me, though, um, and social media, the Twitter is Goldberg, is Goldberg KC. Instagram is Joel Goldberg KC. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I, I try to connect with as many people as I can there. But I have a website, which is joelgoldbergmedia.com, and there is you can contact me right through there, and that's a great way uh, to get a hold of me, too, joelgoldbergmedia.com, and just continuing to to build this and, and having a lot of fun doing it. It's, it's, um, it's not replacing the baseball. I don't think, but, um, I, to, to this point, they, they both can go at the same time and, you know, a little bit different, obviously this time of year where it's nonstop, but I'm not, I'm not going to stop with the speaking and the podcast because I, I really, I love it so much. Well, thank you, Joe. I appreciate you sharing your tips and strategies to helping our listeners to break through those obstacles to achieve success. Warren, thanks so much for having me on. Glad we did this. Hey, thank you. And this is your host, Warren Wandling, saying until next time, make it a great day.